I'm joined by former Prime Minister Paul Keating. Thanks for joining us. I'd love to turn to China now, and you made some very interesting comments in your, in your speech about that. Um, thinking about the yuan, is, is it time now to free float the currency? Well, look, attempts by governments to conceal the real exchange rate uh, by massive uh, central bank interventions every day always end in tears. They either end in inflation or they end in massive distortions in their own economy. The best thing that can happen to the Chinese state, to the Chinese people, is to have their currency properly priced. This will pull resources to the import competing sectors away from exports. It will pull resources to consumption away from investment, the very thing that China really needs. So the earlier China moves to a quantity-based system to price the exchange rate, away from the central bank price system, the better for China. It's not about simply about the rest of us. It's actually better for China. Do you think it would be better to go for a gradual appreciation of the yuan or, or should we just have a free, a free float straight away? Well, a gradual appreciation is an option. Mm. Um, because, you know, uh, I mean, we saw the 18% appreciation from 2005 and then it stopped about 2008. Uh, now it may be that Chinese authorities will appreciate the RMB. But no, no government authority will get the rate right. No one will get the point of equilibrium right where you start seeing an effect upon resource allocation in China itself. I mean, what the Chinese commercial community needs is the right pricing signals. And you ne invariably never get the right pricing signals out of a managed exchange rate. Mm. You mentioned a very big decision coming up in the US next month about whether to, to brand China a currency manipulator. We've not at that yet, but do you think there's a considerable risk of that? I think there is a, a real risk that the American leadership and congressional leadership will move down the road of protectionism, not by effectively by caprice or choice, but they will believe from necessity. Uh, this must already be weighing upon Chinese policy makers and other policy makers. The shadow dollar area, uh, the central banks of Japan, China, the Middle East, in targeting the US dollar has certainly reduced US competitiveness, certainly cost US jobs, certainly cost US GDP. Uh, one hopes that in a more... Uh, knowledgeable world, more responsive world, governments of these states will take their own remedial policies. In the event it doesn't happen, I think protectionism in the United States is a real, is a, is a live option. So you can see a scenario whereby they would simply slap it, say a 10% tariff as you were talking about? Yeah, I think, I think unilateral tariff employments on the goods of what they believe are offending states is entirely plausible. I'd like to ask you about another issue that's been in the news this week, and that's the case of Stern Who. We've had no verdicts yet, but do you, th do you think there's a risk that this will have a lasting negative Im impact on Chinese relations with Australia? No. No, no. The Chinese are too smart for that, and I think we are too. I mean, look, big national relationships go on. Things come on in between. Um, there is a corporate sentiment in China. They, did, they do have a... a they do set a premium on, on vertical integration in the supply chain. The attempts by China to have one of its companies, in this case Chinelco, vertically integrate itself into Rio was a high Chinese priority. That didn't happen. This soured many people in China. But it hasn't happened. And the Chinese are learning that these big companies are just not easily suborned. Yep. Uh, I mean, strange but true as it may be, but BHP, Billiton and Rio do not take that much notice of the Chinese State Council. This may be a great shock to the Chinese State Council, but this is the fact. Uh, they'll learn about that. They'll accommodate that. I mean, the Chinese are quick on the uptake. They're smart. Uh, and uh, while the stern Hue thing is a problem and has been a problem, let's hope it has a proper diplomatic and legal solution. How effective do you think the Rudd administration's policies and, and relations towards China have been? I think, I think it's, uh, you know, the world realpolitik uh, 
I mean, I think that, you know this debate in foreign policy about foreign policy realism. I think the Rudd government has a, a healthy dose of foreign policy realism. Uh, the Chinese uh, have have their own interests. Uh, they're not angels. We are not angels. Uh, there's there's a there's there's a healthy uh, competitiveness and scepticism there, um, which the Chinese will take in their stride. I mean, one of the criticisms has been that um, Canberra hasn't given clear enough signals on foreign investment rules, and um, that has uh, it's caused confusion um, yeah. among some state-owned government, state-owned companies in China who wanted to invest here. Um, do you think it would be a good idea to, to lay that out clear and say what, what our limits are for the FIRB to say this is, this is what our, our criteria is? Well, Australia, as I said in my remarks, is going to, Australia is going to be running a a large current account deficit for the next couple of decades as it funds the big investment phase in our minerals sector. This means that funding the current account deficit is going to be much more tricky, more difficult. The idea that the four banks can simply fund it by borrowing to lend for Australian housing is not going to work anymore. So we're going to see the funding of it by way of debt and by way of equity. So there must be bigger equity positions taken in this economy. It doesn't matter who is running Australia, the Foreign Investment Review Board or whoever. The fact is there's going to be much more direct overseas investment and portfolio investment in Australia. So Australian foreign investment policy will have to take account of that funding, uh, that funding imperative. So therefore there can't be any caprice in the FERB rules where there are real national interest considerations, as the government have made clear on a couple of occasions, fine. But more, I'd say, general will be the rule that most investments will basically be approved. Mm. You know, if Australia wants to grow faster, invest more, have a higher standard of living by borrowing other people's savings, it will also have to take more investment from abroad. Thank you for your time, Mr Keating. Pleasure. Thank you.